Uh, good morning once again. It's very nice to be here talking to you uh, today one more time. And uh, today we're going to talk about, well, distributed architectures uh, and event-driven architecture in particular, because uh, these days, I think it has been true in the past like four or five years, when people are discussing microservices, the first thing that they have in their mind is how can I create a REST endpoint and how can I make communication between remote endpoints through HTTP. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's the best alternative for some use cases, but from my experience, for if you're designing, for example, enterprise information systems uh, for uh, uh, like a big corporation or something like that, that's maybe that's not the best possible architecture. So that's what we're going to discuss today. All this part probably you already know. And this talk, I started this talk because I discussed this subject some years ago. So I published this book three years ago. And when I started discussing microservices or distributed systems in general, like five, seven years ago, uh, the number one question that everybody asked me is say, oh, I get about the code, we have to split this, the, the, the code base or something like that, but what about my data? So to try to find some solutions to this problem, I talked to many developers and teams worldwide and how they were dealing with this distributed data problem, and the initial results of my research are published uh, as this book. But after that, of course, uh, many more questions arise. Uh, I discussed to many other teams, that's why I'm, I'm writing about, uh, another book about this subject. And what I'm going to talk with you today is the, well, is the initial part of my later uh, research about distributed systems and right now an event-driven architecture. Uh, and I got this quote from my book, code is easy, state is hard, or even better, like behavior is easy, state is hard. And when I said that, I, uh, I intended to mean that it doesn't matter how like how hard really is your code, uh, dealing with distributed data is always much harder. So uh, we're focusing on the hard part of uh, microservices, which is how do I deal with state, how do I deal with my data, particular persistent data, how do I integrate, how do I distribute, and how I correlate data. And all of these problems are even worse because uh, in the distributed systems world, we say uh, that data also suffers from, the, uh, from gravity, which means that the more data that you have in a single place, the harder it is to move the data to another place. And the more data you have in a single endpoint, the more data it attracts. Because the more data, the closer the, the data you have, uh, the easier it is, it is for you to establish correlations, to process something, to generate some results. So yes, gravity, gravity also applies to distributed data. And when we have this kind of issues, what are the possible solutions that we can come up with? So. Uh, traditionally, when we hear design applications, as I said before, we have our microservices. Uh, this microservice has its own piece of data. Uh, we have another microservices with another piece of data. And our microservices need to communicate to the, with the other one to, to execute some, some action. And traditionally, the communication that is being done is being through HTTP plus REST. And what are the problems with this type of architecture? Well, usually we suffer from uh, issues like uh, latency. Uh, yes, there is a latency because we're not uh, issuing like any more uh, local invocations in our code base. We need to go through the network, so uh, it at least at least one order of magnitude uh, slower. We also have to deal with uh, issues regarding availability. Sometimes the other the point is not down. Uh, we have downtime on the other side. And if, there, if we don't get the information when we need it, we can, we're not able to fulfill our process. Uh, performance, of course, uh, well, it's also related to latency. Uh, the more requests we have here, of course, the more requests we have to uh, issue to the other endpoint. And when we have a one network, uh, the network between the two endpoints, we know that uh, in the past when we had, and, and think about that, how things are uh, uh, cyclical. Uh, in the past, when we're still designing EJBs, we, all of the communication between our EJBs would have a network loop, even though the EJBs were located in the same application server in the same machine. Uh, then we decided, oh, remote EJBs are a bad idea because we have the network. Then we started to design local EJBs. 
And the nice thing about local AGBs is that you wouldn't go through the network to call the other uh, enterprise Java beans. Everything would run inside the same virtual machine. Well, maybe with microservices, we're going through the same process. Now everything needs to go through the network. And maybe for some data intensive applications, that's not the best uh, approach. And when we're talking availability and uh, an HTTP endpoint through the network, we can say that we have what we call in distributed systems, we have what we call uptime coupling or temporal coupling, which means that both endpoints must be working properly at the same time uh, so I can be able to fulfill some operations in my system. And that's a very tight coupling that we have in our system. And when we deal with, and of course, developers, when they're faced with problems like, oh, I have a performance issue or availability issues, they try to solve these problems with caching. And when we're designing caching, basically what we're trying to do is we're making a copy of the remote data uh, locally uh, so I can, well, I can fetch them faster or I can have availability when the other endpoint is down. We're making a, a local copy of the rem remote data so we can still fulfill our request. And of course, when we're caching, we also need a polling strategy or uh, when I'm going to refresh my, re my, my local data, whenever I have a request for that, am I going to the remote endpoint and see if it changes? If it didn't change, how often I'm going to refresh the data? How often the data gets stale? Uh, so these are some of the many problems that arise when we add some, for example, caching strategy regarding remote HTTP requests. And of course, whenever we have caching, we have to deal with the problem with the venture consistency. And venture consistency in distributed systems is not something that you need to fight. Actually, something that you need to embrace because the reality is that is this that it's very hard to have like strong consistency in distributed systems. Very few applications and very few companies can afford to have a strong consistency in distributed data. And I believe that, again, as I said, one, um, uh, the typical use cases, enterprise information systems, you will need to embrace some venture consistency. And the example that I give, I think about that. Uh, many important business decisions are taken with uh, printed reports. And when I think about printed reports, it's already a venture consistency because the data on the report is something that was like computed and printed like many maybe maybe hours ago or in the day before. So that data is already outdated. So if a business person tells you that, oh no, I need strict, uh, strong consistency, I need always the laser data to, uh, to take my the business decisions, well, maybe it's a lie because as I said before, most business people, they prefer like printed reports and it's already uh, an eventual consistent data. But before we try to uh, figure out some of the solutions to this problem of uptime coupling, availability, performance, and everything else. I have to uh, give some basic concepts, so we'll need to go and look back in the past at uh, approximately 10, 15 years ago to see what, what was the data problems that we had before and how we came up with the solutions that we have today. Okay, I know some of these concepts, some of you might be well aware, aware of that, but I just, just want to establish a baseline so we can discuss the proper solutions. So if we look back in the past, how was data uh, managed 10 years ago? And, oh, or now, maybe 15 years ago, depends on when you started to work with these kinds of technology. So 10, 15 years ago, the world was still developing uh, enterprise Java beans, and in particular, entity beans. And when we're talking about entity beans, uh, to see how old are some technologies, and just give me a moment. So, uh, uh, well, we uh, d discovered some alternative technologies to persistent for to entity beans. For example, we can we have Hibernate, and just to give you some dates to just f for us to be able to realize how old are these technologies. Hibernate 3.0 was released in 2005. Java 6 was released in 2006, and Java E5 and JPA 1.0 were also released in 2006. So this this is how old are these technologies, and these are. Uh, 
the problems that we were facing 15 years ago when we created these kind of things. So when we're talking about entity beans, we're talking about um, a programming model that was heavily based on like we needed to develop like five different classes, five different files to be able to persist some data. And we had like XML file deployment scripters to be able to do any kind of persistence. Then Java 6 came. We decided to move our metadata from XML files to annotations in our code, which uh, so basically we moved from XML hell to annotation hell. But it was a, maybe it's a better hell because we learned it also through the years that uh, metadata is required for us to run our applications. But the closer the metadata is to the data, the easier it is to maintain your application. So we we pick our poison. We uh, prefer to write like uh, uh, metadata and annotations. Well, uh, these days we prefer to have uh, like YAML hell because we decided we wanted to externalize our configuration properties in a very bad format for humans. And uh, we evolved, we moved, and we also moved it from a very specific strict development model like EJBs to a POJO development model. So we didn't need any more specialized classes for persistence. We realized that we could use like plain old Java objects for as our domain model, which also proliferated what we these days we call like a, maybe a bad press for some business uh, uh, models, especially complex business models. We proliferated the notion of an anemic domain model which is that our classes that belong to our domain model should only contain state and not behavior. So this is the context of 15 years ago. And still, many people develop uh, enterprise Java applications these days, still using POJOs, just um, uh, containers for states, instead of adding business domain logic on that. And given this context 15 years ago, some people decided to think about event sourcing. Event sourcing wasn't created 15 years ago. This is a model that was much like older. But some people in the architecture space and in the Java space started to discuss event sourcing 15 years ago. Well, maybe POJOs are not the best option, but we have another uh, persistent style, which is called event sourcing. Maybe for some scenarios, event sourcing is a very nice approach. And I'll have to briefly explain event sourcing just to be sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, the traditional way for enterprise applications to store data is what we call, uh, the lack of a better name, uh, I'll call that snapshotting. And when I say snapshotting, it means that whenever you try to query the information that you have in your system, you always have the current state of information. You always have the latest information. So if I had to model, for example, how much money do I have in my bank account, and doesn't happen this way in the reward when we'll understand why, uh, I would model this, well, every bank account has an ID, has a customer ID, and also has a balance. Uh, so uh, like customer ID uh, or account ID uh, 1001 has a balance of 1000. But we just realized that, that it doesn't work in the real world because uh, in the real world, we model how much money do we have in a bank account as transactions. So when we say transactions, if you think about that, uh, if you think that all bank accounts start with a zero amount of money, and if you apply like debit and credit operations over time, one after the other, you know how much money do you have in your bank account right now. So that's how we model that. So all bank accounts start with zero, and then we just apply transactions over time, like a credit supervision of 1,000, another $200, uh, uh, $2, uh, as a credit, then we have debit operations, and we compute over and over the time. We have the current result of our operations. And when we think about transactions, we're actually modeling the events that are happening in our system. So event sourcing is one way for us to model our events, uh, our system as an event-driven uh, event architecture, event-based architecture. So if you think about transactions as e the events that happen in your systems, I think the greatest benefits of using event sourcing, this particular type of enterprise information system, is that events allows you to, in to think about what happened in the system, instead of thinking about the structure of the data first. And I'll blame the way that we learned how to develop systems. I don't know uh, like um, what I realized in Ukraine, like most of you, even though you're very highly skilled developers, most of you are younger, 
than, than myself, for example. Uh, but when I, and I don't know if it resonates with you, but when I learned how to like design my systems, I, we're still we're doing like structured programming and we're still doing things like DFTs. And the first questions that I learned when we're doing like uh, the analysis of the system, trying to gather the requirements, we were talking with the business people and saying, well, what are the entities that compose your system? So we would say, well, my system uh, contains a customer, contains a bank account, contains an order. Okay, so yeah, we captured what are the entities in our system. And now, uh, oh, let's talk about the customer. What does, does the customer have? Well, the customer must have a name, maybe a surname, a telephone number, a social security number, must have an, a have an address. Uh, so depending on the requirements, you would just keep discussing because the most important thing was we need to realize what are the entities and how my data is structured. So only much later in the system, in a structured programming at least, you realize I have these entities and how does the data flow? So what are the actions that my system must execute so the data would, the data would go from here to the other point so I could change the state of the systems? And when I think about, uh, I think again, the greatest benefits of doing, uh, thinking about the events first is because right now in the complex systems that we're designing today, it's much more important for us to think about the behavior of the system first and talk about the structure of the data later. So traditionally, we've been doing um, uh, Java development with a, like a data-first approach. Uh, we've thought about the structure of the data first and later about the behavior. And what I'm advocating for distributed systems is that think about the behavior first and then about the structure of the data later. It will help you a lot when trying to think about an event-driven architecture. And another concept was coined approximately 30 years ago uh, was CQS, Command Query Separation. Uh, the first time I read about this concept was in Bertrand Mayer's book about the language AFO. And I didn't uh, realize how important was this concept like, 25, 30 years ago, but now uh, these days I can see how important it is. CQS basically stands for Command Query Separation, and this quote is from Bentram Mayer's book. Asking a question should not change the answer. What he's stating is that you should model your system as separate command and query interfaces. So basically, if you're a Java developer and you're trying to design your data access abstraction, abstraction layer, you should, separate, uh, you should have separate interfaces for uh, query commands, for query uh, methods, and, and a separate interface for command methods. So if you're changing the state of the data, you have a separate interface for that. And if you're querying the data, you have a separate interface for that. And at the time, I was silly, so I didn't do that for many, many, many years because, because in the end, you will implement these methods on the same class in, in Java because you're always using, for example, a relational database. So, but now I can realize uh, how important it is this concept because when Bertrand Mayer said this, asking a question, not change the answer, or you should separate your interfaces, your query and command methods in separate interfaces, is that because when you have separate interface for query and update methods, you can also choose different technologies for updating and querying your data. And that's the typical use case that we have these days with distributed uh, systems. We need, or most of the times, we will choose different technologies for querying and updating the data. So from CQS, we evolved. So uh, 10, 12 years ago, uh, Greg Young coined the term SecureS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And if you think about the term Command Query Responsibility Segregation, if you try to understand the words, you will realize that uh, I don't know what it means. Because maybe it doesn't, was intended to mean anything. Uh, what uh, I think the initial reasoning uh, 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 from Greg Young was that I needed a, an acronym that was close to CQS but different. So he just coined it CQRS and then decided to pick the words later. That's why we got this very meaningful acronym. But CQRS, basically, we're trying to apply CQS to an event sourcing style of architecture. We want to have like separate interfaces and technologies for reading and writing. And the reasoning behind CQRS is that 
We had a pojo-centric world 15 years ago. Some people were trying to discuss event sourcing. But again, if you use it to, an, uh, to a, a typical abstraction, it's very hard for you to change your mind to a different abstraction. So CQRS initially was created to try to bridge these two types of words between pojos, snapshotting, I just have the current state of data, or event sourcing. Event sourcing is too different. People just don't grasp the result. It's very hard for developers to understand how to model event sourcing systems. So let's try to create an intermediate step. Let's try to create what we call this day CQRS. And I know many people uh, have different definitions of what is CQRS on the internet. I'll try to give you a very simple definition or explanation of what is CQRS. Well, CQRS means that you will have different models for reading and writing your data. So in a typical application, like a CRUD application, when you're using POJOS, you will use the exactly same model for persistence for your business classes in your code and your view, which means that, well, it's, this model is so easy that we have scaffolding tools for uh, doing these things these days, which means that if I have a customer table with these dependencies, I just fetch this result, I'll populate a Java bean called customer, it will have the entire data of the customer, and then probably I'll serialize that information as JSON uh, in my REST endpoint. So I'm using exactly the same model, maybe different uh, representations, but it's in the end, it's all the same model between all of the layers. When I'm talking about uh, CQRS, I want to use different read and write models. So if you ever created a view or a materialized view, for example, or a DTO, you create a CQRS model because you're still persisting with the customer class and you're querying your information with a custom, customer DTO, which for, uh, which, for example, could have like, some aggregated data or could have just a subset of the data. That is a different type of view. So CQRS is not different from what you've been using, but may, maybe most people didn't realize what CQRS was uh, at the time. So if I had to translate this kind of example into uh, tables, I would say that, well, maybe my customer is persisted like this way. I have like ID, name, phone, address, and birth, and if I want to insert the data, I would uh, issue and insert with all of the with the with the fields, and if I need to extract information, we will select star from customer. That's a typical CRUD architecture. But whenever I have a requirement of like having like customized reports or fetching customized data for performance reasons, select ID, name, and phone uh, uh, from customer. I'm creating a customer DTO with just a subset of the data. That's one CQRS view. If I have another view, select ID, name, and address from customer, I have another customer DTO, customer DTO2, which is a very bad name, but it's another kind of CQRS view. So we started to develop these models. So I'm pretty sure that almost everybody did these things in the past. We just gi didn't give like a very shiny name like CQRS to that. We evolved the CQRS, and later we realized that, well, if I'm using different models in my application layer to write and read the data, what prevents me from using separate data stores in the persistence layers for these separate models? And I need you to pay attention to this picture because that's the typical distribution, distributed data pattern that is being used worldwide for enterprise information systems. What we're using here <coughs> is that our application is writing information in a typical write data store. And for enterprise information systems, this write data store uh, inevitably is going to be a SQL database. Then we are propagating the changes from this write data store to another read data store. For example, it's not unusual these days for uh, some uh, systems. I'm writing this information in my SQL database, but I want to to query my information in an Elasticsearch database. So I just need to find a way to update my read data store with the information that is re being written in my write data store. So I can have like other technologies here on the other side. And even if you're still using a monolith, you could be implementing this kind of technology. Just because, I don't know, maybe Elasticsearch is faster for some types of queries and I want to use, uh, for example, SQL for these types of queries. But 
when we're talking about distributed data and microservice architectures, well, we don't need to have like these both data stores in the same location. They don't need to belong to the same microservices. Uh, they can belong to different endpoints in your system. So all the magic behind this distribution, distributed data pattern that we're talking these days lies on this particular error. Okay? There are many different technologies they can choose for their your right data store. There are another like, uh, uh, great amount of different technologies that you can use for a read data store. And of course, a lot of different technologies that you can use to implement this error in your system. So the secret between distributed data, again, enterprise information systems, if you want to use like an event-driven architecture, is how do you pick your technologies trying to implement this picture? Okay? And just to give you the classi classical example back, uh, here I have two different CQRS models with separate data stores because this view could be implemented in a materialized view, for example. And in relation to databases, most of the times, uh, materialized views are implemented as physical tables. So it's a different data store. We can consider, for example, a view as a separate data store in your monolith. And how do we match these concepts of CQRS and event sourcing? What we learned from uh, event sourcing. Event sourcing has some great benefits to our architecture. And as I said, in the modeling part, allows you to think about the behavior of the system, which is a good thing. Uh, in the other like architecture benefits of event sourcing is that uh, you have free auditing, you have a, a free time machine, you can understand what happened in your system, you can always roll back in time and understand how much money did you have a bank account uh, in a certain uh, uh, period, like last year, uh, same day, same time, but one year before, how much money did I have in my bank account? It's very easy for you to start from zero and replay all of the transactions over and over until you have the, the amount of money at that specific time. But uh, uh, while with uh, event sourcing, you have a very uh, high, uh, uh, high throughput for write operations, you have a very low throughput for read operations because every time you need to compute uh, your current amount over and over again. And the more transactions and the more bank accounts that you have, the lower your, the slower your system is. So that's why in typical scenarios when you use event sourcing, you always match your event source and architecture with a secure S representation. So here is the event sourcing part, and here is my secure S part. So even though I'm writing my operations here in the transaction table, I'm reading my balance in the account table. So, and I find a way to update um, the data that is being written in the transactions tables in the account table. If you're using a relational database, you're probably using transactions about that, but then you're restricted to a certain type of technology, and certainly it's not distributed. So when we're thinking about how can I blend these two separate abstractions in the distributed world, uh, the answer, of course, lies into how can I update my right model that is being constantly updated? And how can I propagate the data change between my right model and my read model? And as I mentioned before, it's another version of the same picture. I'm just using transactions and account for that. The circuit lies on how I'm going to implement this particular error. Okay? And why CQRS? We learned that in the past, when we would create a specialized query or create a DTO in our code, CQRS architectures were created because of performance. We were solving a performance issue. I, I wouldn't be able to issue a select star from customer because I would fetch an entire database into memory, and certainly it wouldn't perform very well. But as of 2019, we are creating CQRS uh, architectures in enterprise information systems because I need to distribute the data. I need to make my data available. Uh, even though when the remote endpoint is down, I need to be able to process and fulfill my requests. I also need to perform data integration because when I need to process something and I want to correlate this local information with the remote information, I need a CQRS architecture for that too, which also blends with the availability part. And think about that. If I have a model in which I have a write that is stored and I create some sorts of events 
that will update my remote data store. Uh, I need a way to propagate these events from one point to the other. Uh, and typically, you will use, for example, a broker for that. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Kafka or another technology. We will usually have a broker to be able to distribute some messages. And what prevents you from intercepting those messages on the fly to generate some very nice statistics, right? If you ever try to, per to perform some analytics in your, in your data, in the past, like in the 80s, you would try to create very complex SQL queries and run in your database. Then in the 90s, you would have, have to create what we called, for example, a data warehouse, which is what? Snapshots of the data over time, so you could have like a three-dimensional dim um, uh, view of your data. So you wouldn't only have the current state of your data, you would like aggregate the data, uh, because it was too costly at the time, and then you would project the data over time, so you would uh, try to create some interesting queries. But these days, because we have like a different set of technology, things can be much faster, and we are already in propagated data uh, change events over the network, so why can't we try to intercept those kinds of events and try to perform some real-time analytics? So it's not unusual for uh, some uh, teams, for example, after they evolved, oh, we already created uh, a, secure, a secure S architectures over our distributed uh, system, and now we're trying to capture these events so we can use that, for example, to put these events on a Spark pipeline and try to get some real-time information. Oh, how much, t how much uh, I'm selling right now on my website? Oh, if you uh, have a car uh, share, uh, car riding, a ride sharing company, uh, how many rides I'm getting right in the last five minutes? You can have this time, uh, this kind of information in real time, without disturbing uh, your, for example, your uh, real time database, like your hot database. So I can fetch these this, this things uh, very easily just by tapping, just by wire tapping my message broker. So these are some of the strategies that are enabled by using like an event source and architecture with SecureS with the models distributed in your system. So just to give you, and again, emphasize my point, uh, more pictures. A typical enterprise information architecture these days will consist of I have a microservice, and these microservices is my canonical source of information, which means that this one is my right data store. Can you allow more than one endpoint to perform writes on one particular data? Yes, you can, but uh, then you have to uh, you have to deal with con data conflicts. And even though some business models allows you to have conflicts, I'll tell you that the typical enterprise information system doesn't allow for this kind of inconsistency. You always need a canonical source of information, and I would consist, uh, consider like typical eventual consistency as an exception. Because as I said before, enterprise information systems usually don't tolerate uh, uh, this kind of conflicts very well. And if I have my customer microservice, which is the canonical source of information, and you might imagine you need the customer information in many other endpoints in your system, at least to correlate the data. Uh, I need to know the idea of the customer if it exists, for example. It's a very uh, reasonable um, argument. So I will create replicated SecureS read data stores. So the customer information will be available on the other microservices that depend on the information. So think about uh, in a traditional HTTP plus REST architecture, whenever you need the information, you will go and fetch the information from the canonical uh, nodes. Uh, and then you have to deal with temporal coupling. In a typical SecureS, a typical event-driven architecture, you don't fetch the data. That data comes to you. So you don't have to worry if the data is available, if you, the other endpoint is available, if it's processing properly, if it is slow or not. You, the endpoint that is processing the request, you always have the information that you need to fulfill your requests. And how do you do that? By having copies of the relevant piece of information in your local database in the same type of data store that you're processing your business requests. So yes, you have multiple copies of the data. You don't have to store the entire set of information. For example, if you're the shipping service, 
and to fulfill your request, you only need like the ID and the address, the current address of the customer. You won't store the entire customer information. You won't will only store the piece of information that is relevant to your microservice. Okay. And from the canonical source of information to the other endpoints, you will model that data changes as these kinds of events. Okay. So this is the historical context about how we arrived on this type of architecture today. So let's try to discuss the solution, how we are going to implement this particular error here in our system. So back to the future, back to 2019. One of the possible ways for you to try to solve this problem is using an event-driven architecture. And uh, uh, event-driven architecture is a very broad uh, subject. Uh, that's why I'm trying to write uh, a book about this subject. And I'm only going to discuss today uh, the data distribution patterns of an event-driven architecture. Okay? So for us today, what are events? Events are facts that happen in the system. Okay? Because another way that we can model things in an event-driven architecture, we can model things like commands, for example. We won't be discussing today because it's not relevant. We only want to deal with the events part. So events are always in the past. So when you're modeling the events in your system, just realize that uh, events will always be things that are uh, written in the past. So you will never have an event like called like, uh, create customer. You, but you will have an event called customer created, uh, order shipped, okay? payment accepted. So events are always things that happen in the past. And if these things are in the past, we have another property of events. Events are always immutable. You never change an event because that's something that happened in your system. Oh, what if an event was never supposed to happen in my system? Well, it is a fact. It already happened. Uh, if it, uh, it was an error, now you have to compensate this kind of mistake. So you always deal with this kind of past. You never ask permission for an event. Event already happens. If a microserver was never supposed to process this event because the, the customer didn't have amount, enough, uh, uh, an enough amount of money or the credit card wasn't accepted, doesn't matter. The event already happened, and now you try to create some compensating events to deal with the data changes. And when you're thinking about events, uh, the discussion that I also ha want to have today, how do we model this type of in our systems? We typically, we can have two different types of events in my system. Low level events and domain level events. And if you read some people on the internet, they will advocate for you that, oh, domain level events is the ultimate goal. You only like doing event driven architecture right if you have domain level events. And now I ask you to have to, to, to be extremely careful because from my experience, that's not particularly the truth. Even though, I, yes, I still believe that domain level events are the ultimate goal. Uh, the perfect system would only have domain level events. And well, what are domain level events and what are low, low level events? The low level events that we can have in our, my, in our system are created, updated, deleted. Okay? These are the, uh, the possible low-level events. And why is that? Because uh, yeah, they have low, very low-level semantics. You don't know what actually happened to the entity. You only know that it was created, updated, deleted. You don't know what type of change you had in the data. But the semantics never change over time. Okay? What changes? Well, the only thing that changes in low-level events is the scheme of information. You never have a change in the semantics. Okay? They're fixed. But you have a change in the schema because, well, maybe I added an additional field in the customer. Maybe I changed uh, a certain field in the customer. So you only have to deal with the schema change. With domain level events, well, let's try to enrich our model. And that's what most like people advocating domain level uh, events will say. Oh, we have to enrich because if you use events, everything is loosely coupled. No. When you have an event-driven architecture, the coupling, of course, is not anymore in your code base. The coupling is in the events in your system. So the more semantics you put in your events, the more coupling you have in your distributed system. 
Uh, but the problem that is that in the past, if you needed to refactor something, you would just go to uh, your IDE and refactor everything. Now that you have events, well, there's no way for you to know who is consuming your events. So you have to be extremely careful trying to model domain level events. Let's try to add some kind of uh, semantics to, to my domain level events. So instead of having just customer updated, I could say, uh, uh, could say like customer address changes. So and think about that. In a low level event, if I only have customer created, customer updated, customer deleted, if your microservice depends on the customer information, you need to subscribe to the customer channel because you need to be aware of all the customer data changes, right? If you have a domain level event uh, and you have uh, events, for example, customer phone number changed, customer address changed, customer payment type changed, if, you're in the shipping, if you are the shipping service, the only type of event that you need to subscribe to is the customer address changed event. Okay, you don't need to be subscribed when the phone number changes or when the uh, payment type changes. I only need to be aware if the the address changes. Okay, so this is one type of uh, additional semantics that I have. So you have much more cues in your system when you have like domain level events, but on the other hand, we will have you have to subscribe to to fewer cues to to be updated uh, uh, of the data. But again, uh, we can have different levels of abstraction with domain level events. So suppose that my shipping service was only interested in customer address changed events. But then later, I decided to enrich my model even further. So I, I'm not interested anymore in just customer address changes. The shipping service, for example, I, want, I have different business logic depending on if the uh, if it, the customer address changed, but was it an intra-state move, or it was it like an international move, or it was in the same state, was it to, to another state, or was it an international move? So, so my shipping service needs to deal with that differently. So, whenever you try to change the semantics of the events, you added additional types of events. You changed the semantics of your model. Everybody that was subscribed to that type of events need to change again. So domain level events, you have coupling on the semantics level and on the schema level too. If you have low level events, you only have coupling on the schema level. So you need to accommodate for these types of changes too. Oh, so you mean that low level events are better than domain level events? Again, it's a software architecture thing. Whenever you have like architecture in the problem, it's always a matter of trade-off. Uh, Low-level events. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the only trade-off is that I need to listen to all the events. No, because again, if you're the fish shipping service and you have special logic regarding, well, the address changed. Was it intra-state? Was it inter-state? Or was it international? For you to know these things with low-level events, you need to store the previous information, always. So you need to receive the events. You need to compare with the current uh, state of the data that you have. And you say, oh, wait. Well, this address was in one state. This address is in another state. So I need to process these in a separate business logic. Okay? When you have domain level events, depending on the type of the semantics of events, you don't have to carry your local data. Uh, you can process just the event. So these are some of the discussions that you need to have when you're processing with uh, uh, low-level events and domain-level events. And just to complicate in the third, if you have domain-level events, uh, how much information do you propagate in your domain-level events? Right? Uh, I advocate that uh, you should uh, propagate. You should never. Uh, uh, try to be super concise in the information that you're propagating to the events. I think uh, it's better to be like broader, like you broadcast more information in your event and you let the other endpoint deal with how much information do I need to process my event, okay? Because I truly believe that because of performance and availability for enterprise information systems, uh, 
And why, and why I'm always mentioning uh, enterprise information systems? Because we have some other business use cases where we don't have to deal with complex queries in our local endpoints. And typically, enterprise information systems, you always need to aggregate the data. You always need to, call, to issue like complex SQL queries in your local endpoint. So I believe that the local endpoint should have like the right amount of information to process their requests and not just receiving them through events. So they are, that's why I believe that even domain level events, they should be rich. You, ha you should have a lot of information. But that's um, a, a nice discussion to have later too. Okay. So we have we discussed the different types of events that we can have in architecture. We have to have that in mind. Uh, I strongly recommend you, if you're starting to distribute the data in your system, always start with low-level events because it's so hard to change domain-level events if you did it wrong. And if you don't have the proper experience doing that, you inevitably fail. Uh, to be completely honest, I've only, uh, I did this mistake like, uh, at least like a couple of times in the past, but I've only met one team so far. They work in a bank finance uh, company, and they were able to move their legacy information system to uh, an, an event-driven architecture using like serverless and all this kind of stuff, uh, using message queues, Kafka, and uh, uh, MQ, uh, MQP using the mailing of events, but what happened? Uh, the legacy programmers, the guys that implemented the system in COBOL, they became the business analysts. And the Java programmers that designed the new system were just, uh, well, they, just, uh, were, they were the developers. And the COBOL programmers, they've been doing the same thing in the past 30 years. And the business model didn't change in the past uh, 30 years. So they knew exactly what type of event that happened in your system by heart. Actually, because of their business model, they would knew exactly, oh, event number 33 happened. Everybody knew what event 33 meant. So they modeled uh, the Java system the way that it was in the past. So they deployed, they completed the migration in six months, and they did it right in the first time. But that's the only uh, example that I have of a team using domain level events and doing right for the first time because their business model didn't change in the past three years. It was com a completely stable domain model. But if you know, if you're not, like, it's very typical when you begin uh, the development of your system, you, you're not sure if your semantics will change it, will change. I always recommend low level events because, and you can enrich them later. Okay, so always start with low layer events because it's much safer. So just to finish, because we're almost over time, uh, what are the, some of the key technologies that you can think about when trying to implement an event-driven architecture? For example, you can use, uh, if you need MQP, a traditional message broker, you can use Artemis. Uh, if you're interested in the history, of your event, you can use a persistence, uh, persistent message broker, for example, like Kafka. And what is the benefit of Kafka? I think well, the nice thing about Kafka is that it's replayable. Because it's persistence, uh, you don't always have the, la uh, the latest message. You can always ask Kafka to, oh, replay the message for me since the beginning. Oh, since message ID number like 1001. So you can, over time, you can ask Kafka to replay the message from a certain point. Uh, in the log. And why is that nice? Well, suppose that you're doing some profiling, uh, customer profiling, and I have uh, the current profile in my CQRS um, uh, database, but then I changed, the, I changed the profiling algorithm. And maybe my new algorithm is better than the, the data that I have. Well, why don't you keep your current CQRS with the store? You just create a, repl a replica. And you, well, you try to run uh, the same thing with the same events uh, over again and compare the results later. You wouldn't be able to do that with a message broker. Well, technically, well, I'm saying you wouldn't. It would be very hard for you to do that because you would need to get the source of events again. But with Kafka, it's a very simple operation. You just uh, uh, need to uh, ask the broker to replay the message for you because they are already there. Uh, and many people believe that uh, if you need order guarantee, if you're using low-level events, uh, probably you need uh, order guarantee, which means that I need to receive the events in the same order that they were created. Okay, 
there are very few models uh, that are called CRDT, conflict-free resolution, resolution data type, which means that the order doesn't matter. But again, for enterprise information systems, it's not usual to, to, to be able to proper uh, model these data types. So I'll consider this an exception. But uh, most people are not aware of that. But if you need order, MEQP can uh, give the order to you. So when should I choose one or the other? Again, if you need re to be able to replay the events, Kafka is the winner too. But again, with Kafka, you, the developer, needs to deal with a lot of guarantees uh, that are already provided by a traditional message broker. So it depends on the use case. Uh, if you want to deal with the issues or if you want the broker to deal with the issue, uh, you would choose one technology between the other. Uh, and of course, if you're talking about events, it's inevitable that you need to transform these events or root these events or aggregate some type of information. And the most popular integration library in the world is by far Camo. It's something like that most people will have to use when dealing with uh, events in the distributed system. Uh, I uh, urge you to take a look at Dibizum, which is a very nice open source project which implements a CDC uh, architecture. If you want to play with low level events, uh, and if you're using Kafka too, for example, they're a very nice match because Debezium uses, uses Kafka. Debezium plugs directly into your database, and whenever you have an insert, update, or delete, Debezium fetches the information and generates uh, the, the, respective, uh, the corresponding event in your Kafka queue. Then you probably, it's a very raw, very, very low level message, but if you need to enrich or transform something, you just create an another camo endpoint and you transform that to your proper. Uh, message format in your system. And of course, if you want to implement and use all of technologies using, like, for example, reactive messaging in real time with low, very low memory footprint and super fast, maybe we want to take a look at Quarkus, which was the session that I delivered yesterday. And I planned to have some minutes for questions, but I think I was over time. But that said, I wanted to share you for now. And of course, I know this is a very uh, subjective topic and an opinionated one. So I would love to discuss you with you uh, even further more. I'll be available to the entire day. But for now, thank you very much.